Hey guys, so for today's video I thought I might try something a little bit different. I thought I might show you a video of my day-to-day -day setup. Now, part of the reason for this is that I'm sort of changing how I uh, my day-to-day -day workflow in maybe some more uninteresting ways, and this is just one of the ways that I can sort of relay to you through this channel because, you know, this is a tech Linux channel uh, for the most part, so it sort of would make sense... Um if I showed you guys sort of my desktop, I guess, give you a bit of a desktop tour. Uh, this is going to be a bit rambling and meandering because I don't really have too much of a plan what I want to show and demonstrate in today's video. I just want to sort of give you a bit of a brief overview of my day-to-day -day workflow, the applications I use, and uh, just a few tales of me, how I uh, sort of got to grips with this operating system and, um, uh, and, uh, and why I'm going to carry on using it. So... Uh, as you can possibly guess from the wallpaper here, I decided to go with Manjaro, uh, and this is my main desktop machine. This is the machine running the uh, AMD Ryzen with the uh, NVIDIA GTX 970 graphics card. It may be not the fastest computer in the world, but it's certainly fast enough for uh, some video games, some, some editing. Um, it's got 16 gigs of RAM, so it's certainly um, dealing with everything that I'm throwing at it quite comfortably, um, at least for the time being but yeah it's a grand old machine so uh, when it comes to these kind of machines I always find that having an arch based distribution really helps because it gives you the latest versions of uh, all the software that you can find in, in, the, uh, in the Linux world and and that always helps make the most of your hardware. Whereas with older machines, I might tend to go on a distribution that isn't updated particularly often, very low maintenance, maybe like a, a Lubuntu or Zubuntu LTS release. So, you know, we're talking uh, quite a, a range of uh, on a spectrum here. But um, I decided to shift my workflow a little bit because I often end up testing distributions on my laptop. And my laptop I use for a lot of personal use, day-to-day -day stuff as well. But uh, it's, uh, I, I use it in a very uninteresting capacity. It's mostly web browser and, and you know maybe playing some videos, playing some music, that kind of stuff, which any Linux distribution under the sun can really do without breaking a sweat these days. I've got Fedora on it, but it might as well be running uh, Ubuntu. or Actually, it's got Pop! OS running at the moment, which I may do a review on. But yesterday it had Fedora on, uh, before then it had Ubuntu on, or one of the various Ubuntu flavors. So, um, yeah, and even uh, MX Linux, so it doesn't even, you know, it, it doesn't even seem to matter if it runs Systemd or not. It's a very, it's a very good uh, entry-level laptop that I've got there, but really I've just not been throwing particularly difficult tasks at it. So I decided to do a bit of a switch around and have my laptop as my more sort of stoic day-to-day um, boring machine where maybe if I'm just doing a few emails, maybe if I'm just watching a few TV shows or whatever, I can you know do it on this machine, not have to worry about it, put it away because the operating system is not particularly important um, because it's just doing very basic tasks there. Uh, and then this machine here, my desktop, the one that I play games, edit video on, do the live streams on, um, this should be the the showcase machine. This should be the machine that you guys are. Um, that I'm sort of reviewing the most, speaking on the most, and um, and that's why I decided to make the move to Manjaro. Now, I'm not particularly wedded to the distribution of Manjaro. It's a rolling release that's based on Arch, but it does use its own repositories here, and I quite like uh, Manjaro. I've always had, had a good history with it because, in part, it always has a good selection of software just in its base repositories, which I, I really quite like. But um, it also has access to the AUR, um, famous for it being an incredibly large library, but also one that's uh, a little bit uh, wild at times. It's not maybe the safest place that you can find in the Linux world, but um, it's served many people who use Arch and Arch-based distributions very well over the years. I've also played around with Snap packages, which seem to be, for the most part, easy enough to uh, set up and get running on uh, on Manjaro as well, uh, as well as I've been trying out the old app images. So when it comes to my essential applications, I usually try and find uh, app images of uh, recent known working builds and rely on them if uh, for example, an application is not available in a distribution's native repositories or uh, readily available, you know, within arm's reach from there thereof. So, uh, yeah, I just rely on app images to fall back on when I uh, when I don't have uh, the options facilitated to me. But Manjaro is really quite good. In fact, I'm, you know, between Manja Manjaro and Turgos Arch in general, um, they don't tend to have problems running app images, flat packs. 
uh, snaps, anything out of the AUR. I, I would wager to say that on Arch-based distributions, you can run more programs, more versions of more programs than you can on just about any other Linux-based operating system. But uh, that's just a that's just a sort of feeling that I have. But it's, I mean, I can't think of one off the top of my head now that uh, that offers anything uh, anything close to the AUR. Um, uh, maybe I suppose app images or or one of the other might uh, might sort of fill that place at some point or another. But because uh, the thing is with app images is that because you have to sort of go out and get them, there is this natural level of scrutiny that you might instinctively gravitate towards an official provider rather than just a third party website. Um, so in certain theories, uh, with good habits uh, underlying, app images can can be as safe as they need to be. Anyway, uh, before I ramble on too much, let's. Uh, crack on with some more of the visual elements of today's uh, today's video now as you can see here I've got simple screen recorder that is uh, recording it's a, a pretty straightforward but uh, a pretty straightforward screen recorder with plenty of options uh, I do strongly recommend it although uh, the one downside is that it only records from one audio source. So, for example, if you're doing a Let's Play or a screencast like this, you can either choose to record maybe an associated microphone like I'm doing with the blue, yeah, uh, the blue snowball, or you can choose to record the computer audio and then have maybe like a uh, one like oh I got the uh, the handy h2 here but you could use the handy h1 or the Tascam or anything like that as a separate audio source to record and then mix them together in post uh, I do use Caden live uh, which I don't think I've got um, as one of my running applications on today's video I could open it up if you particularly wanted to Caden live is a fantastic video editing program it's really the premier video editing program on Linux and also available as an app image and because that that's such an important program to me because it's it's what allows me to edit these videos. Uh, it, available as an app image with all the necessary dependencies bundled in means that I I get to to choose um, you know whatever distribution I basically want uh, and at the same time um, I have those those essential fallback applications. But yeah, when it comes to recording screencasts like this. Uh, yeah, you really can't beat Simple Screen Recorder because it's it's reliable. It's in the repos of most distributions. And it does the uh, it does the job reliably with uh, with all the settings that you need and um, and that's about it really. Uh, but if you do need more advanced um, sound capture options, OBS will have you covered. Um, but um, let's uh, we can minimize this and uh, we'll crack on to uh, screen space number two. So as you can see, this is a huge mess of windows. Now the icon theme that I've got here, the less. Uh, Let's minimize a few of these. So as you can see, the icon theme is the default theme that comes from Manjaro. I do love the um, the the theme of the uh, terminal here, and uh, console uh, is the application that comes. So I've mostly stuck with the KDE apps because if you're going to go with the KDE desktop, you might as well. Um, the theme that I have is the Oxygen theme for the. Uh, window borders and application style uh, with the uh, yeah with the default icon set and the default uh, color set which is based on breeze but it's called breath and it's just a green version of breeze which is I mean I gotta say I really quite like that uh, the background wallpaper itself um, I think it was something that uh, something that uh, that I've found in the Manjaro space somewhere. I can't actually remember specifically, but I absolutely adored it, really. Um, but I'll try and track down the um, uh, some accreditation and put it in the description there for you, because I'm sure a few of you guys will probably want to uh, to check it out as well. OK, so let's take a look at Firefox here. Now, Firefox is uh, one of the few GTK applications that I've got on the computer here. Now, generally speaking, I've set GTK 2 and 3 applications to run a light theme, uh, as opposed to the, the dark theme that you can see here, which I think looks really quite nice. But because dark themes can give you theming issues, particularly with non-native toolkits, so in this case GTK, uh, I've just decided to skip any potential complications and just run uh, all my GTK applications with light themes. Um, and it looks fine from uh, from my point of view. Not every theme has to match perfectly, just as long as they look vaguely nice and the colors vaguely match, or at least contrast in a coherent way, then 
uh, then I'm fine. Uh, now with Firefox here, I've themed it specifically dark, but that's a Firefox theme rather than a GTK theme, and it looks pretty nice. I'm a big fan of dark themes in general. They're not a must. I'm, I'm generally pretty flexible with these kind of things, but with KDE, it gives you so many cust uh, customize, uh, customizability options that I uh, I decided just to have a bit of a mess around, and this was uh, this was the kind of uh, uh, scheme that I came up with, although it's largely just a play on the defaults with a little bit of retro beveled edge theme uh, goodness thrown in. Okay, so what I'm going to show you guys now is my workflow in relation to app images. So if we just bring up the uh, uh, Dolphin File Manager and go into bin there, um, so these are just a selection of my app, uh, or a selection of my portable binaries, but these are mostly app images. Um, and uh, keypass XC is the one that I tend to rely on the most. And uh, as you can see here, uh, it loads up um, just as it's uh, as it's supposed to. I think the version that I keep down here, uh, this is. Um, uh, native with the operating system itself, but I've also got Krita, Red Eclipse, Caden Live there, of course. Um, so uh, yeah, app images always ready to go just in case uh, any of the native applications decide to fail on me. So the native key pass XC that I've got installed here is actually the one that's native in the Manjaro repositories. The app image, of course, is just for backups. Uh, but I really do quite like using KeyPass XC because it allows you to keep your password information offline, and even you can use it in uh, you know like USBs like this, for example. That um, uh, that just mean that you actually have a you're, you're able to employ the use of physical security uh, in addition to digital security when it comes to a lot of your password stuff which I think is uh, is quite useful and especially when it comes to unimportant passwords that you don't use very often um, there's no reason why they need to ha be sort of immediately quickly accessible at all times online especially if it means a reduction in security so I'm a big believer in offline security systems and procedures so that is why I quite like the uh, the good old key pass encrypted database I'm not too fussy on the kind of software that I use. I, I'd be just as happy to use KeePass X, although that's perhaps not as maintained as, as well as it uh, it could be these days. But KeePass XC is a, I think it's a community fork, which, uh, I mean, it really just does the same job. It reads a password database. That's uh, what it's intended for. I think KeePass XC allow you to do I don't know, fingerprinting and key files and all that kind of stuff, although KeyPass X let you do a fair amount as well. Uh, just to have a look in the system tray, you can see this. Uh, there is Skype here. Uh, Skype is installed via a snap package. Um, it just seemed like the easiest way of least resistance, although you could probably install Skype through the, uh, through the AUR. However, um, Snipe have officially released their client in the snap store I believe or at least it's got the um, we can check ourselves can't we snap find Skype uh, yeah so you can see here Skype Skype uh, yeah so it's developer is Skype um, presume so Microsoft um, yeah, I did. I did think. I do think. I actually did hear that this is possibly one of the ways that they're thinking of, um, rather than use PPAs. Uh, it does seem that Microsoft and Skype are looking that maybe this might be the de facto way of of getting uh, Skype out there. Uh, I mean, if it works as well on Arch as it does in, in Ubuntu, and it seems to so far, then there's really no reason why Skype wouldn't want to distribute their. Um, their client as a as a snap package. It'd be nice if they did an app image, but uh, you know, as long as the whatever gets the program up and running, that's what I always say. So uh, yeah, pretty good on that front then. Um, I'm sure, but like I say, I sh I'm sure I could have installed Skype uh, just as easily through the AUR. But I wanted to give out snap packages a test and. Uh, not doing too badly. The only AUR package that I did actually end up resorting to download is uh, Dropbox. Uh, it was just the easiest and most, most straightforward way um, of, of getting that job done at the time. And um, so so that's what I decided to do. And as you can see here, the one remaining icon, I've got um, my, uh, my connection there. And uh, I've got uh, RSS Guard, 161... 161 unread news articles. So mm, I've got to be catching up on my reading there. So um, I think that's largely about it for the most part. I could show you through the menu. I mean, it looked, doesn't it look really quite nice? Um, and I have installed a few bits and pieces here and there, but when it comes to Manjaro 
and Arch based distributions, I, I often find that you just tend to install uh, packages as you go. Now, there are a few things with rolling releases that I am going in cognizant of. Uh, the first being that um, there are a lot of updates. Like uh, one of the main reasons that I usually ditch a rolling distribution is because you're just downloading hundreds upon hundreds of megabytes of updates, um, a lot of which you don't really need. Uh, so, you know, this is a lot of why the Arch um, philosophy of, of running a lean system comes in, because when you're upgrading everything on your computer, whenever it becomes available, that, that adds up. So, you know, Arch users typically tend to like to keep a lean a lean uh, machine for those purposes. Now, with a lot of faster internet connections these days, that's maybe less of a problem, but then again, programs are larger. So uh, my, my most frequent reason for leaving a rolling release is update fatigue. So we'll see how... Um, how that comes along and how that affects us. Uh, also, I because of this, I generally would not recommend someone to use rolling releases like Arch, specifically, I'm, I'm thinking of Arch here, uh, on multiple devices, because that does seem just like a multiplier effect to to the upgrade process. So, I you know, I would only focus it on, I, I would tend to lean towards rolling distributions on machines that you spend a lot of time in front of, that you don't mind maintaining, that there is a benefit to running the newest, latest, and greatest software. And for all of those reasons, I think that this distribution suits me quite well. Uh, the latest and greatest, or near enough, Manjaro is maybe a beat behind when it comes to Antergos and Arch. They hold a lot of packages back for the sake of um, of testing and stability reasons, which is why uh, one other reason I decided to opt for Manjaro over Antergos. I know a lot of people um, uh, don't like that and thus opt for Antergos. Um, but I really don't mind having a... Um, being a beat behind uh, something as, as bleeding edge as Arch, if it means just a touch uh, more reliability, because at the end of the day, I do want to get videos out to you guys, and uh, you know, less systems going down is going to uh, going to help in that regard. So that's uh, one. Of the, that's one of the reasons that I decided to go for Manjaro. It does seem like it's a distribution geared towards my specific use case. Uh, it's very good on on the multimedia side of things. Very good on the games side of things. Um, for a home distribution with you know hefty bandwidth and decent hardware, Manjaro is definitely a good pick. Now, one of the things that does overhang with uh, rolling releases is that because you are up, you know, doing full overhaul upgrades every time that you do it, you know, that you're running them, uh, it does leave the potential for problems to arise more commonly than maybe other slower moving distributions, but. Uh, that is part of the reason for my overall change from from bringing my desktop to being my primary uh, testing rig rather than my laptop. Now, because my laptop only did boring tasks and it was considered a secondary machine, I did think that it would then be ideal for testing Linux distributions. However, uh, I've just come to the conclusion now that pick a distribution and run it on that laptop and it'll, you know, within a few uh, Google searches, you'll be able to get it do doing the same thing that every other distribution will do. So I need to knock it up a notch. And that will mean that I will probably not be testing out uh, distributions as in-depth as frequently. I might be running a few uh, distributions on a virtual machine and then relaying, relaying them uh, to you. But since so many distributions are based on one of the larger builds, Ubuntu or um, or something Red Hat based or uh, even you know a lot of Debian based distributions there as well. I mean, we already know they run on bare metal, so sticking them in a virtual machine to have a look at the aesthetics and the workflow side of things is probably going to uh, going to work out all right. Um, just to answer the point of slightly, um, so so to sort of bring bring that point around a little bit when it comes to the stability of the machine with the rolling release structure, um, it is going to be nice to have that that laptop that I can that will be then the machine that I rely on. This will be the moves fast breaks things machine, which which does suit Manjaro and Arch based distributions a little better because well if I do a big overhaul upgrade without really checking all the uh, bells and you know all the um, valves and uh, and nozzles and whatever first and then I end up breaking something. Well, I'll just do a reformat, and you can pave, and then get back on that horse. Um, and that's pretty much a, a, 
uh, all I need really. Okay, so I think that's about it for this video. Thank you very much for joining me. But before I go, there is one thing that I did neglect to mention, and uh, and that is that although KDE Plasma has been a good looking distribution ever since I first laid eyes on it years and years and years ago now, uh, it's also brought a lot of that um, visual appeal into the practicality of it as well. And one of the best examples is the hot corner setup that, that Manjaro comes with out of the box, which is if you just move your mouse cursor to the top left hand corner and just apply a bit of pressure, it lays out all your windows on that one screen space um, and then you can just click on it and it'll take you straight to the one that you want uh, or you can just uh, reverse and, and go back to where you were. Uh, that is a feature that um, I know that uh, it's been in GNOME for quite some time now and it's been in KDE for quite some time I think it might even be available in other desktop environments but uh, but yeah it, I just find it to be really useful looks really quite nice and snazzy as well and uh, it just makes a nice addition to the traditional uh, taskbar that you see at the, at the bottom there. Uh, as you can see, I've actually laid out the taskbar in the more traditional way that you would expect from KDE um, because it doesn't take up too much space and is practical and you know generally quite visually and uh, visually consistent as well as from a design point of view. Uh, KDE definitely gets a degree of criticism for, for having a lot of features. For maybe have being too customizable or or, um, or having too many bells or whistles, um, but I've got to say that all of the the settings and all of my my user experience has been very intuitive. And when you go into a distribution like Manjaro, you do go in there knowing that you need to apply yourself to a greater degree than you would do with an Ubuntu based distribution. So, for those of you at home thinking of trying out Manjaro. Um, I hope I've contextualized it well enough in, in, in the video, but it certainly is a distribution where you need to be paying attention um, and it's not going to hold your hand through the entire process. That being said, the Manjaro wiki is some fantastic documentation. So uh, whenever you're, you're thinking about um, you know, embarking any kind of challenge in Manjaro, installing a, a particularly complex program, it might just be worth consulting the Manjaro wiki uh, just to see if they've got any notes on it because there are, you know, for things like widespread known issues or things that, you, you know, anything that you might want to be aware of, you know, it helps to know ahead of time and the Manjaro wiki or even just having a look at something like the Arch wiki as well for a bit of reference or for a bit of backup assistance um, if in terms of information. Definitely worth a look because... Uh, uh, yeah, a documentation is definitely your friend with a distribution like that, uh, like this. But fortunately enough, the distribution tends to be pretty well done. So, and that's the way that I quite like it as well. It doesn't need to have all this extra, you know, um, uh, sort of uh, handholdy stuff through the UI. Uh, this is the di distribution where uh, documentation would be considered sufficient and there is also a really good community around the distribution as well one of the things that um, that brought me back to it uh, however I don't know how long I'm going to be on this distribution I'm going to stick with it until I get bored of it and then I don't know maybe Solus maybe Antergos maybe Vanilla Arch who knows um, but at this point in time with this desktop machine the gaming machine the live streaming machine I'm just gonna have some fun with it see where it takes me and have maybe a slightly less structured uh, kind of uh, testing regime. I don't know. I'll um, this channel's ever growing, and uh, it'd be interesting to see how it goes. But if you have any thoughts, let me know down in the comment section below. Thank you as always for watching, and until next time, I've been Chris Ware, and you've been awesome. Take care now.